webinar from Paulus Evangelization Ministries, the RCIA, Exploring What Works. Kathy Swartz, a pastoral associate at St. Elizabeth's in Rockville. And I, of course, am Frank DiCiano here at Paulist Evangelization Ministries. And we're basically going to have a, a chat with Kathy about the things that she's been doing. Uh, how many years have you been working in the RCIA, Kathy? Almost 25 now, 22 at my current parish. Yeah, 22 years in, in uh, at St. Elizabeth's, which uh, I'll have her explain the kind of parishes when we get underway. But first, we want to uh, say a prayer, one of my favorite prayers, the prayer for evangelization. So if you would join with me in praying, loving God, you called us each by name and gave your only son to redeem us. In your faithfulness, you sent the Holy Spirit to complete the mission of Jesus among us. Open our hearts to Jesus. Give us the courage to speak his name to those who are close to us and the generosity to share his love with those who are far away. We pray that every person throughout the world be invited to know and love Jesus as Savior and Redeemer. May they come to know his all-surpassing love. May that love transform every element of our society. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And also, before we get underway, let us spend a moment remembering a great leader in the Catholic Church, a tremendous example of the power of lay leadership, Lee Nagel, who was the executive director of the National Conference for Catechetical Leaders. He had just uh, presided over a very successful conference of the NCCL in St. Louis and was uh, visiting his family right after that and suddenly died at the young age of 66. So let's pause for just a second and thank God for the ministry that he gave uh, not only catechists but the whole Catholic Church during his many years of ministry. Amen. Thank you. So, Kathy, before we get underway, could you just give us a little description of St. Elizabeth as a parish, uh, help people locate like uh, the size and the numbers of people, et cetera? Sure. We are St. Elizabeth's uh, Catholic Church located in Rockville, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. It is a parish that has about 1,600 families with approximately 3,000 people coming through every weekend at our six liturgies. Um, we have been with the same pastor, Monsignor Jack McFarland, since 1992. I have been with him the entire time, and we have run an RCIA program that entire time. And actually, through uh, meeting with Father DeCiano, have been incorporating a various various number of programs in the parish that he has introduced us to. Okay, thanks Kathy. So um, the RCIA obviously begins with invitation. That's a drum that we particularly beat here at Paulist Evangelization Ministries. Uh, why don't you talk about the ways that you get the word out so that inquirers and seekers can begin to get involved in, in the RCIA ministry at St. Elizabeth? We put regular notices in our bulletin and we have a variety of promotional materials that we have printed up that we have available in our gathering space for people to pick up. We also periodically announce from the altar at the end of Mass when a new series of inquiry is beginning to invite people to either come if they're sitting in the parish and are interested or if they know someone who's not at Mass who might be interested. And a personal invitation is what we have found often works best whether it be someone in the parish, whether it be someone's spouse or friend, that if you know somebody that you think might at all be interested in finding out more about the Catholic Church, that can be the number one thing that will get them there, is if you invite them. Right. So kind of a, a lesson from this is how we sensitize uh, Catholics to seeing uh, people who might in some way be interested in discovering Jesus in our Catholic way of life and, and just extending that invitation. It's not something that Catholics easily do. So um, obviously the uh, RCIA has members on the team 
and uh, there's a catechumenal team and they were sponsors. Why don't you talk about the ways you get people ready for this kind of ministry? Well, we have a somewhat probably unique situation at St. Elizabeth's where the team that I have who are three people who coordinate and facilitate inquiry for us have been the same people for almost the entire 22 years that I have been there. Uh, it's a husband and wife and then another woman who just have an extreme interest in working with those who are interested in finding out more about the church. They're very well educated themselves with a teaching background and also very, very comfortable at sharing their faith and know not only a lot about Catholicism but about other faiths as well. They happen to love doing this ministry. I wouldn't normally expect a volunteer to come in with us and spend 18 to 20 years doing the same thing, but they don't want to leave, and they're too good for me to want them to leave, so we keep them on board. Then when folks move into the catechumenate, I have a team of um, others that, are, that include the priest at our parish, the deacon, several interested and educated parishioners who also are interested in sharing their information about Catholicism. So I found that other than doing um, some minimal training and a retreat with them, I've not had the occasion to have to do a lot of training. That can vary from parish to parish depending on what you have available to you by way of volunteers. And then when it comes to sponsors, the um, the sponsors, of course, are, some, are usually people who don't have any kind of experience in sharing their faith or what it means to be a sponsor. So I do work more with them. I use resources that are out there for, uh, that talk about what it means to be a sponsor to an adult, and we usually will have some kind of a retreat with both the sponsor and their sponsoree. The sponsors don't necessarily know the person that they're going to be sponsoring, because if someone comes in to the RCIA program and doesn't know someone who's Catholic that they'd like to ask to be their sponsor, I have people in the parish who will do that, and then we just introduce them as part of that process. So you have some people who are repeat sponsors over several RCIAs? Correct. Mm -hmm. Once someone, it can be very challenging and difficult to get a sponsor, but once someone is a sponsor, they tend to love it and want to do it again. Mm -hmm. I bet, yeah, because Catholics so rarely see the faith kind of coming alive in someone else, so it's very exciting to see that. Correct. Now, uh, only 15% of Catholic parishes, I'm sorry to say, have year-round RCIA, and you do. So I think it might be very helpful for people, for you to talk about how you do year-round RCIA and acceptance into the RCIA as part of your ministry at St. Elizabeth? Sure. We have the actual weekly gathering of inquiry discussion group going on year-round, specifically so that when someone comes to us and asks about an interest in the Catholic Church, we can say, sure, you can start next Monday. We meet on Monday evenings. We're never at a point where we have to tell someone, I actually just met with two people this week, as a matter of fact, who came in and asked if they could be part of the RCIA. And in a lot of cases, parishes have to say, well, yeah, we love it that you're interested. Come back and see us again in September when we start our inquiry. We don't do that. We actually do meet every single week um, around the, the, the whole year. And then the way we do that is that um, my three people that I mentioned before who do inquiry, they do meet with the group. Um, whatever group there might be, from September to June. But I give them the summer off, and then I take over with another team of volunteers running a summer series of the classes so that if people who are currently meeting in inquiry and any new people join are interested in meeting in the summer, we do that. Occasionally we'll have people who just want to take a break themselves in the RCIA so we don't have to have the classes. But we go ahead and have the discussion group no matter what. Then what we've done is we've identified a couple of times during the year when we'll celebrate the rite of acceptance, which as you see on the slide here indicates usually that's in September and January, so that if we happen to have a group that we feel in working with them and their feelings too, that they are catechized to the point where they would like to move into a catechumenate, we will then celebrate a rite of acceptance and welcome in September 
and lead them into initiation rights at the end of November or early December. Otherwise, we do the standard January right of welcome and acceptance. We, the next point, we're open to initiating candidates at just about any time, handling them on a case-by-case -case basis. This is something that I picked up in attending some RCIA workshops at RE Congress out in LA, if any of you are familiar with that, that it seems that a lot of the powers that be who are very involved professionally in the RCIA are recognizing that a lot of us in parishes, just for expedience sake, are tending to treat our candidates and our catechumens the same in the way we bring them into the church and are indicating that it really is important to accept and understand the Christian catechesis that many candidates have already been through. So that if you have someone, like I do for example now, who is a fully catechized and has been regularly practicing Episcopalian, who is married to a Catholic and they're raising their children in the Catholic Church and she's decided she would like to become Catholic, you can't treat her, we can't treat her the same way we would treat the person who walks in and basically has never heard the name of Jesus and has not been baptized and is looking to receive all of their rights. So if someone is a catechized Christian already, whether Catholic or another Christian faith, we do um, bring them in at other times during the year rather than focusing them on an Easter vigil acceptance. Whereas the catechumens, those who are not baptized, we do guide into a little bit more formal catechesis which will be a longer period and generally is focused on the Easter Vigil. I, I think the phrase you have there, case by case, is, is very important because we need to differentiate more uh, catechumens and candidates because I think the power of the RCIA is really shown in the conversion process that catechumens uh, undergo. So uh, in terms of catechumens and candidates, uh, what's your general ratio? How many catechumens and how many candidates and how does that work? Well, I, I had to give this some thought when you first asked me the question because I had never really looked at it that way. Of course, I could go back through my records and get it exactly. But in general, it seems that we will have one candidate for every, uh, excuse me, one catechumen for every three to four candidates. We have more candidates who come to us to be received into the church than we do have those who are unbaptized looking for baptism. Um, and I think that pretty much holds true over the past years. And right now, I, I want to say we've got 15 people participating right now, and probably four or five of those are unbaptized. Mm -hmm. I wonder what is the uh, dynamic is among the people who are already baptized, the candidates, uh, when they see the catechumens kind of coming at this from a very different angle. Uh, what, what's going on in their lives? Yeah, it seems to really bring out a lot of conversation among them because most of us, even if we're cradle Catholics, have not had, as adults now, have not had the opportunity or been encouraged to talk about our faith or what baptism means to us. And yet we're putting candidates into a discussion with people who are not baptized who are talking about what it means to them to be baptized, what they feel they've missed out on. Mm -hmm. And one question that I get fairly often from the candidates who most likely were baptized as infants, is can't I be baptized again too so that I can have this memory that the catechumens are going to have? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, a little uh, envy, baptism mm -hmm. envy. Baptism That's envy. Terrific. So what do you find is bringing people to think about becoming a Catholic these days? I, I think this is an important uh, approach, of, an important thing to explore because very often we, we just say, well, who wants to become a Catholic? As, as It's like, you know, who wants to buy Kellogg's or who wants to buy Post cereal? And, and, but, but there's a whole kind of attraction of Catholicism, something Catholicism uniquely has to offer. So what is it that people are looking for? Well, in our case, it's pretty much always another person, which is why that personal invitation is so important. We have um, everybody who comes through the door looking for more information about the faith, I meet with in a one-on-one. -on -one. And in almost every case without exception, there is somebody else who comes with them, whether it be a friend, a spouse, a significant other, but it's someone who is Catholic, this person has admired their practice of the faith, 
or sees something about the community that they have when they go to church, because usually they've come to church with them, and that's another thing. So that's why the ritual of the Mass is there. And they, they want that. They didn't grow up with that. They did not experience that. And yet they see this as something that, as an adult now, has come to mean a lot to them. Um, I do have people who come in, and because of the social outreach that the church does, they say, this is something that really strikes to the heart of me, and I want to be part of a formal group that is really finds, that really finds social outreach important. And then Pope Francis, of course, has done a huge amount in his just one year so mm -hmm. far of being pope in people seeing that attractiveness of a pope who's saying out loud and not afraid to say, we need to let people know that we love them and show them that we love them before we start worrying about whether or not they're following the quote unquote rules. And that is meaning a lot to people too, particularly if they're people who've seen the church as a church of rules and can't understand how that can mesh right. with who God is. Yeah, often I, I think it's uh, many Catholics who don't see the power and cogency of, of our own faith. They, you know, they practiced it, but they've never unpacked the spiritual, relational conversion reality that's happening inside Catholic life. And, and so I think the more that we can make the attraction of Catholicism, particularly today when people are, are given so many different expressions of, of Christian faith, and, and today when there's such a big atheist push, uh, to really see what uh, the Catholic Church has to offer people today is, is very important. And when you, when you mentioned, too, about Catholics not understanding a lot, I find that all the time. The, a lot of times these friends, spouse, significant other who come in to the initial inquiry interview with the person who's asking about inquiry, they want to know if they can participate, too, or at least they're, the person pursuing inquiry wants to know if they can participate. And our inquiry is open to anybody who wants to attend. So usually what will happen is the Catholic person will say, well, I'll come with you the first time or two just until you get used to being with the group, but this is all stuff I've already learned, so I won't need to continue with it. They never want to stop. They, mm -hmm. They've just not had that right. experience as an adult of being part of a discussion group about mm -hmm. their own faith. Yes. Um, yeah, that, uh, that's fascinating. Uh, maybe it's like uh, golf. You're always learning and relearning the game because mm -hmm. uh, you never really see the whole piece of it. Uh, what, do you, what do you find uh, is... Uh, bringing candidates as opposed to catechumens to think about the Catholic faith? Well, in addition to what we listed for the catechumens coming in, I get a lot of comments from people who are candidates indicating that they just feel like there's no cohesiveness to whatever they were raised in. Um, I had a, a spoke with a young woman, one of the people who came in this week asking to be part of the Catholic Church who said she was raised by a Mormon father and a Catholic mother, but that the two of them, parents, spent more time arguing about the different, their different faiths than they did really trying to impart any faith to their children. And that that made her very uncomfortable, that she really wanted to have one faith. She's involved with a Catholic young man, and they're steering themselves toward marriage at this point. And he's a very devout Catholic, and in talking about what she'd like her faith to be, she just has decided there's a lot she finds attractive about the Catholic Church. She wants to be of one faith when they get married and have their children and raise their children in that faith. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing, is that incompleteness. Uh, well, that's kind of does both of those points there, the incompleteness to their Christian faith and then also the two-faith families. I get a lot of that two-faith families and also a lot of no religious practice at all. And that can be in the two-faith families where the parents have said, well, we're just going to let you grow up and decide what you want. But as a result, the child is not provided with any faith. And then again, they get to meet someone who was raised in the Catholic Church who is very devout in their Catholic faith. And they say, I've been missing something all this time, you know, and I want to find that myself. So in they come. Yeah. It's always interesting to me uh, when I interview parents who want to have their children baptized or they're thinking about it, what have you, um, well, you know, well, maybe we'll let him pick later when he grows up. And I say, uh, are you going to let your child uh, starve until you find out whether your child wants to eat Chinese food or uh, German food or Italian food? Or you're not going to teach your child a language until, you know, he decides he wants to speak Russian or what have you. That 
we inevitably pass on what is ours to our children and and, and uh, to realize that that's happening and, and when it doesn't happen, uh, uh, children do feel that. And I've heard that that same analogy with school. You know, are you gonna are you gonna raise your child and let them decide whether or not they want to go to school, and hope they get to a right. point where they want to be educated, or are you just gonna let it go mm -hmm. even if they don't like school and mm -hmm. say, okay, you can wait until later. I know some uh, evangelical friends of mine talk about a marriage that's uh, uh, there's an uh, that it's unevenly yoked, that one of them has stronger faith and the other one isn't quite so strong. And my experience is that if you have a couple like that, they're probably going to decide in the direction of the one that has the stronger faith. Mm -hmm. And I think Catholics need to realize their ability to really witness to others and invite them because of the strength of their faith. So uh, what do you find is the most challenging part of this uh, catechumenal ministry? What are the concerns you have? What is it that demands your special attention? Uh, you know, you keep having to fix or, or look at again. Mm -hmm. What would you say that was from your experience? Sponsors has always been a challenge, and um, I am in touch with a lot of RCIA directors in our area, and then when I go to these conferences, and we all kind of share these same things. Um, it's just very hard. I, like, in our parish, we can get volunteers for a lot of things just by making an announcement from the altar or putting it in the bulletin. But I don't really get a great response about that when I'm looking for sponsors. It has to be a personal invitation mm -hmm. there as well. Mm -hmm. Because they're just, they're afraid. They're afraid they need to know something, that they need to be educated in something. And basically we're simply telling them, you just need to be a friend to them who's willing to talk about your own faith. And they find, they do find that once they've done it, they absolutely love the relationship that develops. But there's that concern on their part about how can I possibly teach this person anything about the Catholic Church. But we're not asking them to teach. We're simply asking them to be a friend who walks with this person coming in as they journey through their own development of faith. And then the other challenge is the idea of, of mystagogy, which, again, in a lot of workshops we go, that I go to, this is something that's ongoingly discussed because in the RCIA process, it's been suggested that mystagogy be a continuation of the weekly discussion groups that you have in inquiry and in the catechumenate. But in all my years of doing the RCIA, I have oftentimes attempted to have mystagogy after the Easter Vigil, but in spite of the big high that it is to receive sacraments, people are just done with those weekly meetings when that's over. So it's very difficult to get them to show up for that. And because they see, often see, the receiving of sacraments as the end goal to attending these classes, there's nothing to encourage them to attend mm -hmm. discussion groups even more mm -hmm. afterwards. So a lot of what I'm hearing in workshops more recently is this idea that we encourage people to use the scriptures from uh, the Sunday, the Easter Sunday, the Sundays of Easter, the Easter season to pray and offer them a time to get together if they would like, but just to, at the very least, encourage them to not stop going to Mass, because that can happen as well after the Easter Vigil, but to keep going to Mass, to really spend some time, particularly during that Easter season, with the Scriptures, to pray over that and to reflect on what their coming into the Church means to them at that time. And so that not making getting together a requirement has been the route that I have gone um, most of my years in doing this now is that there is no requirement for them to gather with me or anyone else afterwards, but I do try to keep in touch with them and encourage them and, and ask them what's going on in their lives, particularly during the Easter season and that immediacy of receiving mm -hmm. their sacraments. Do you find that there is an ongoing connection between the sponsors and the sponsored? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. it, it really depends on how much, because, I mean, you can have sponsor bombs, you know, where they say, yeah, they'll do it, and they may mm -hmm. meet with them a few times during the, the uh, catechumenate, but then they don't, uh, really, don't really develop an ongoing relationship with the person. Mm -hmm. And then other times, um, actually, this, this uh, most recent vigil we celebrated, I found that one of my youngest sponsors ever, I mean, she's a young adult, she's, mm -hmm. she's an adult, but a young adult, 
has been one of the best sponsors that I've ever seen. She really got into it and made a great connection with this um, person I assigned her to. They did not know each other ahead of time, and they still make plans to meet at the same mass on the weekend and go out to lunch or brunch afterwards and um, and just talk about what's going on in their respective lives. And um, So it, it does happen, but it's certainly not in every case. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the observations I frequently hear made, whatever its validity, is that so often people uh, get uh, catechized to the catechumenal process, the meeting every week and sharing the scriptures, et cetera. And then when they enter the church, that doesn't continue. So sometimes their experience is, I mean, in a way they'd like to go back to the RCIA, but what the, what, is, what does the next step look, look like for them? And they can't figure that out. Sure. It, yeah, it becomes kind of a... Um, a I can't think of the phrase right now, but but yeah, Easter Vigil happens and then everything mm -hmm. just stops. Yeah, well, the same so. is true with confirmation. Very often, I'm afraid. So mm -hmm. um, we we need to think about and grow about this in the church. Well, one of the things I do is that um, I do encourage them, particularly as the catechumenate is more drawing to a close, to really start thinking about and exploring the various activities and ministries that we have in the parish and to get involved in one right away. Mm -hmm. Because they're already giving a minimum of two hours a week to the church by participating mm -hmm. in the RCIA. So I don't, I, I encourage them if they want to join something else, but I don't, I don't try to push them into that at that point. But they definitely need something to replace that two hours that they've been using mm -hmm. to gather at the church. Because mm -hmm. the RCIA groups tend to form a real support group kind of feel, but then that's all gone after right. the vigil. Mm -hmm. And it, and if they want to continue, uh, you know, I'm always encouraging them, I'll find a you know, space and time for you. I can meet with you as well. They never really want to do that. So that's why I start encouraging them. Start looking at the other things that are going on. I have my, my catechumenate team who facilitate the discussions talk about the kinds of things that they're involved in. The sponsors are asked to talk about the things that they're involved in and maybe invite them to things that are going on in the parish mm -hmm. to help them see that there is something else that they can do that will help replace that kind of support group feel they had mm -hmm. by the weekly meeting. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. So um, what are the particular joys you have in uh, kind of leading this catechumenal process all these years? Well, it really is something that, um, I, as I tell everybody who comes into the RCIA, is that no one of us hopefully ever gets to the point where we say, okay, I know it all, I'm ready to move on now, or I'm ready to receive my sacraments now because I have no other questions. I, to this day, and I've been a Catholic all my life, love learning more about my faith. And I learn a great deal by participating in the conversations with the folks that are coming through the RCIA, the perspectives that they have, and even... Um, I've been doing this such a long time, I'm very used to being part of a discussion where I share my faith, but it's definitely not anything I was raised in. So I just feel, I really feel blessed to be part of these groups, to be able to be, um, to learn as much from them as I hope they're being able to learn from me and the rest of us who are in these uh, discussion groups. And then I always tell them that I, um, I don't have any children myself. But whenever there's an RCIA group who are receiving their sacraments, I kind of feel like my little chicks are graduating. Uh -huh. So it's always a very emotional time mm -hmm. for me. Mm. So you're being a spiritual mother. I, I guess that's it. No, St. Paul was a spiritual father. Um, I, I know questions are coming in, and thank you. We will have time for questions uh, after we're done with the presentation. So thank you for sharing your comments. Um, so the, the RCIA has both a spiritual dimension where people are kind of exploring the scriptures and what that means to them, but also a kind of a doctrinal instruction uh, part to it, like what is the Catholic Church and so how do you, how do you uh, what resources do you use to kind of look at these double emphases? We use a mix, which. Um I think is, is really kind of the only way you can go. I don't think there's any one thing out there that would be something that you could use and say, okay, this is all we need to do. If you're unfamiliar with the U.S. Catholic Catechism for Adults, um, I find that a really great resource, and it's something that we actually use in the inquiry stage. 
the inquiry, while it's typically and continues to be with us, a wide open forum for discussion, people can bring up any questions that they want at all. We also put a little syllabus together where we um, cover all of the chapters in that uh, Catechism for Adults. And that brings up more questions on their part, but it, it shows, it brings doctrine into it, it brings Catholic teachings um, in a user-friendly way, if you want to put it that way. And then we also have created some materials ourselves where we've um, maybe gathered some prayers together that we go over, just to give them a kind of a one-piece handout on prayers, on scripture, where to find things about um, what Jesus has said, teaching them how to read and use a Bible. Um, many people, believe it or not, uh, come into, even if they're, they're candidates, may have all kinds of catechesis in their faith, but they come in and really have no idea how to look up a uh, Mm -hmm. scripture reference in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we cover a lot of different things that way. And then we happen to use a copy, uh, we happen to use um, Foundations in Faith for our catechumenate, which is a, a, a take-home book that we don't really, we don't assign it as homework. It's more a reflection process. But there's one book, and I didn't, I didn't tell Father Frank this ahead of time because I didn't know if he'd let, well, I suppose he would let me push something that he has written on here, but he wrote a book long ago called, um, Presenting the Catholic Faith, which is uh, kind of a catechism for inquirers. And I use that book all the time wow. because I really find it, I can really only find it on Amazon now, but I really find it to be a great book to give to people who are newly coming into the inquiry process because it's written in question and answer format. It's written in simple enough language that no one feels like they're being handed a a text on theology that they have to wade through in order to become part of the inquiry. And, um, and so I just, I find a lot of different, um, a lot of different resources through, and, and the Paulists do have a lot of resources that are great for this process as well. So we just kind of pick and choose from a variety of places. And because as we all know, we all learn in different ways too. So some people like the written word, some people like something that's in a DVD, others want to be, um, just sit and talk about mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So right, yeah, there are all different ways that people absorb and uh, appropriate things. I I find that in the preaching ministry that sometimes whatever you say or what have you, it's when you do the ritual that people connect and they say, oh wow, I really got that or or experienced something there. So um, we've uh, we now dismiss the RCIA participants at Mass. When, when I started uh, in 1972, the RCIA had not yet evolved. And we basically were doing the old inquiry system. So the idea of dismissing people at Mass was, oh, well, why would you dismiss them at Mass? You want them at Mass so they can see what the Mass is all about. So um, I see these people go in, in various churches where I preside. Uh, what is their conversation like once they leave on Sunday? Well, when we, whenever we're celebrating a rite, like the rite of acceptance or one of the scrutinies, something like that, that dismissal session is, the whole discussion is based on reactions to that rite. So if, um, if the rite, for example, for the scrutinies is directed at those who are catechumens. Now, I know the RCIA recommends that candidates are not dismissed because they are already Christian. However, because they're not receiving communion yet, we have taken on the whole time I've been doing this, we dismiss everybody, mm -hmm. candidates and catechumens. It just it makes for a better discussion too because you don't have the candidates not able to participate in the discussion on Sunday and yet they are coming on that following Monday night to continue mm -hmm. the discussion. So it's a, it's a different discussion that goes on when we're actually discussing the rite that has happened at Mass. But in general, when we are dismissed, what we're doing is we're spending the rest of the 20 minutes of Mass time, whatever's left, and talking about the scriptures that we just heard, the homily that we just heard, and finding out, turning it in, since we've moved into the, the catechumenate at this point, we are um, starting to share with them what it's like to really reflect on what we're hearing at the Sunday Mass and carrying that away with us instead right. of just you go to Mass and it's over and then right. 
So, so that's our discussion, and then we build on that at our Monday night session. So they're learning to internalize the scripture and the worship as part of that conversation. Correct. Yeah. Oh, that's great. As uh, people often say, a lot of Catholics could uh, benefit from that too. Mm -hmm. So after people have been uh, received into the church, Easter, you know, all the balloons and the mm -hmm. alleluias mm -hmm. and what have you, and the party and what have you, uh, what then? What, what do you see happening with those who go through the catechumenal process at St. Elizabeth? Well, this is always a good question and could also have been put under the category of challenges in doing the RCIA, is do we still see them when that's all over? And I couldn't give you any statistics even in our own case, but I can tell you we certainly don't see all of them mm -hmm. coming to Mass. Um, again, this is why we encourage participation as a volunteer because that helps bring them into the community a little bit more mm -hmm. and helps them get to know a few more people. But a lot of it I find depends on what their initial purpose of coming into the church might have been. Some of them, um, not a lot, but some of them their purpose is purely to, um, they're, they're, usually this is in the case of having a spouse or a significant mm -hmm. other, really would like to see them become Catholic for the relationship to continue. Mm -hmm. So in their mind, the RCIA person, they've f fulfilled that by becoming Catholic, but that doesn't mean that they've developed, unfortunately, this sense of, I want to participate in further practice of my faith once I am mm -hmm. initiated into this faith. So, but I would say at a rough guess, probably 50% of the people who participate at least, we do still see coming. Mm -hmm. Or if in some cases they, they move away, we're in a very transitional area where people may be in town for a short amount of time to go to school or to be at NIH or something like that, and then they're moving away or returning home again. And I'll hear from them occasional and they are still practicing their faith. But, but I would say if that a minimum of 50% are, are staying there, and that always makes me feel good, because if it were sure. none, then I'd really question whether we're really doing anything good here. So. Oh. Yeah. Um, anything I, sticking, anyway. So I think, too, uh, it's very hard. I mean, a lot of the uh, catechumenal process is still geared um, with a view toward marrying uh, someone who's Catholic. And usually when people marry, they move somewhere else. So there's mm -hmm. almost an inherent moving thing into it. But I've certainly heard a lot of concern in recent years about people coming through the RCIA and, and not continuing in the practice of the faith. And that's something that all of us who are in the, in the ministry of evangelization need to reflect on very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. And then... Uh, People may be uh, uh, listening in the seminar, and they're about to begin an RCIA ministry. And you know, Father came up and said, "How would you like to lead the RCIA?" So, what are the what are the things you would like to say to people who might be starting this uh, uh, ministry of the catechumenate? Well, we definitely have to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit. It, it it's easy from a staff point of view um, in a parish to say, well, we need people to do this and we need people to do that. But that's all well and good. But our faith is all about the operation of the Holy Spirit in our midst. And so we need to remind ourselves, I think, to be open to that and to remember that what we are experiencing someone else doing doesn't necessarily reflect exactly what's going on in their life. And so we need to let them, you know, mm -hmm. let them feel the spirit in their lives as well. Again, that personal invitation is a big part, whether you're inviting someone to be in the RCIA or whether you're inviting someone to be part of your team. And having some sense, too, that you, as a team, you need to be open to that experience of the Holy Spirit as well, that different people are going to bring different gifts to your team. And so a team is definitely, I think, the way to go. You don't mm -hmm. want just one person trying to do the whole thing mm -hmm. because the people who are participating in the RCIA also need to experience different people in the practice of their faith and the sharing of their faith and not just one person. Yeah. And then also, and I, I, I am responsible for a lot more at my parish than just RCIA and I use this line all the time, believe in quantity, quality over quantity because if you can get just a few people 
to come to the practice of their faith and then those people touch a few more people, it's all going to expand over time. But if you think you haven't done much because you have only four people in your RCIA instead of 50 people in your RCIA, you're just going to get frustrated by that. And our numbers need to um, not, not to concern us. It has to be the quality of what we're providing. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Now we're going to uh, look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, we've been noting these, and I'll read them, and we'll see uh, what kind of answers we uh, we make some of it. I, uh, some of the questions came earlier, and you might have uh, responded to the questions uh, as the process went on. The other thing I want to say is that um, the catechumenal process is adapted in a variety of ways in different dioceses, in different parishes, etc. And so certain things might be recommended, or really it's the practice of the catechumenate that that helps us know. Uh, the best way to go about it in a particular area. So in some of these cases, there may not be absolute hard and fast rules, but just general pastoral directions that come about. So Pablo uh, says, you mentioned uh, the team members are educated. Does that mean that they have formal education in theology, religious studies, et cetera, et cetera? What, what, what level of education? In, for the team members. In some cases, it is formal education in that. Again, it depends on the team members that you're able to, to add to your team, the volunteers you're able to find to add to your team. Um, when I, do, I, I probably did generalize that when I said educated. But by, by education, I meant these are people who just know a little bit more about their faith, even from the standpoint of sharing, even if it was out without formal education, than someone who... Um, may just be sitting in the pew and isn't sure about how to share their faith. Doesn't mean they would be a bad team member, but um, would be someone that you'd need someone with the strength of, of sharing and not just that person on their own who doesn't, doesn't have any experience in that. Experience probably would have been a better word for me to use than educated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Joan wants to remind us that the RCA is not a program. Uh, programs have beginnings and ends. The that's, RCIA is a process. That's very true. It is a process, and we often refer to it as a program just because that's the word that comes out, but it definitely is not a program. Right. Barbara, echoing some of that, you call them classes. I learned to use process. What yep. do you think? Same thing, process. We call them classes. We call them sessions. What It's whatever comes out of our mouth. Mm -hmm. So uh, Father Charles from Lexington, Kentucky, what resources are out there to help the RCA process assess which areas each might need uh, more catechesis, more exposure, or experience toward helping to expedite entrance into into full communion? So, how do you discern like where a person is and what's going to be particularly helpful for that person at this point in his or her journey uh, okay. with the Lord? Um, I personally, as the coordinator of the program, maintain a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with the individuals so that if, if there's something in particular they want to talk about their process that they may not want to bring up in front of the whole group, they can feel comfortable to do that. Our pastor is also very involved in this process. And early on, when I get new inquirers, I will have them meet him. And it's just a 10 or 15 minute meeting he has with them face to face just to get to know who they are but then they can feel comfortable in going to him if they wish to. And between he and myself and our regular meetings with the individual, we kind of come to a, a group consensus of where we feel they are or how much more time they might want. I usually don't have individuals who want to take, um, who feel like they need more than a year involved in this journey or process, but I have had people in the past who have asked to, in, to continue an inquiry longer than just the six to eight months that they might be involved in that. Because we don't put a beginning or an end on this, as if, even though I sometimes am saying program, we never express it that way to the individuals because we're talking to them about the process, the journey that they're on, and that there is no set number of months that I can tell them they're going to be participating in this. That all comes along as part of the journey. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you, uh, Kathy, for that. Uh, Joan, again, what qualities and qualifications does a person need to minister well in the RCIA? 
I would say just the love of God and their their love of their Catholic faith and a willingness to share their own journey because we are all on that journey. None of us are going to end. None of us have reached an end either. Yeah, so, so the metaphor of discipleship is very helpful. One, we are helping people uh, become disciples more clearly in their life, respond to the power of the Holy Spirit. But we in our own lives are disciples growing, exploring, reflecting, uh, being challenged by the Word of God, and we need to be open to the Holy Spirit ourselves. So that sense of ongoing journey uh, isn't just the catechumenal process, it's, it's what Catholic life really is all about. And if you talk to Catholics, they know that. You know, if you say to Catholics, well, you know, think of where you were when you were 15 and where you were when you are 25 and where you are now. They can see their life unfolding as discipleship and growth in the spirit, but they so often don't think that's happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. And even though we um, sometimes will re – actually, we are not usually the ones on the facilitator side who – tend to refer to our RCIA sessions as classes, but the people who are attending refer to them as classes. But we never, ever talk about teaching. We're all very fully aware we're not teaching anything. We're sharing and we're facilitating. But the teaching is, we're all learning, but nobody's really teaching. We're mm -hmm. just, we're sharing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and before you had differentiated people who are part of the catechumenal team are people who are uh, priests and seminarians and people that have uh, religious expertise that help you in terms of being involved in this. And then you have sponsors, and the sponsors you emphasize being in touch with their, their own experience and their desire to grow in mm -hmm. faith, and, and that's all they need. So thank you. So Kathy, do you mix children, teens, and adults, or do you keep them separate? Good question. Uh, we keep them separate. We, our director of religious ed works with uh, children and our youth minister works with teens and we will have them celebrate sacraments together. But in terms of the, the educational process that they go through, the, um, the sharing that goes on, I am dealing just on the adult side. And then with the teens and the children, this is usually in conjunction with either their Catholic school or their, uh, our Catholic school or our religious ed education program. And so they're learning a lot more. And ours is a family-based program as well. So the kids themselves are taking sessions outside of their religious education classes that are helping to bring them up to speed if they're out of sync in age and sacrament, sacramental uh, reception. But the families are also involved in that process. Um, pardon me if this sounds ignorant, but uh, children, I assume, when they're going through the uh, I, I hear different phrases, the OCIC or, you know, the Order of, of Christian Initiation for Children. Uh, do they have um, scrutiny rituals as well as adults, and do they do these with adults, or do they not? We have actually never done scrutiny rituals with the children. Um, we do have them participate in the rite of welcome and acceptance, mm -hmm. and then they do, of course, receive sacraments. But they aren't necessarily... At our place, since we do this stuff year-round, they aren't necessarily all focused on the Easter Vigil. Either. Right. It's more mm -hmm. of when we feel they have reached some mm -hmm. some real, um, um, uh, what do I want to say, that they've, they've gotten to the point where we feel they are catechized to the point of receiving a sacrament. Mm -hmm. Because another thing that happens, too, and this varies in parish to parish, is that the RCIA process itself calls for anyone over the age of reason, which the church right now is saying is seven, when they are um, catechized to receive sacraments if they were not baptized as an infant, should be receiving all three sacraments of initiation at the same time. Mm -hmm. That can be very difficult to sway the parents into believing that that's a good thing because they want their child to be receiving sacraments with their class. So we might baptize someone, but not provide them with First Communion or Confirmation yet if they haven't reached the age of second grade or eighth grade. And we might baptize and give First Communion to someone who's under eighth grade, but not confirm them because they're going to continue with right. their class. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of 
not hard and fast controversy, but there's a lot of discussion about out there about how to handle it, and it basically comes down to whatever the pastor wants to do. So. All right. Yes, and uh, there's so much variation in terms of the celebration of the sacrament of confirmation that when the Synod of Bishops met in October of 2012, uh, they basically said there are a lot of different practices out there. God bless you all. So mm -hmm. um, th th there's really so much variation. Now, Anne here asked the question, if canonized catechumens both have little knowledge of the Catholic faith, scripture, etc., is there any problem having them together, candidates and catechumens, equally without much awareness? Yeah, no, I, like I, I mentioned, we do them together. Um, our, our whole process with the RCIA is with the catechumens and the candidates together. The only thing that we might do separately is that we might some, find that some candidates, depending on their catechesis from before they came to us and whatever their previous Christian faith was, may feel, and we may agree with them, that they're ready to, be, to make their profession in the Catholic Church prior to having to wait until, say, the Easter Vigil or whatever our next official or formal sacramental reception might be. So, and this, again, was something that I picked up at workshops out at RE Congress where they were saying that parishes should feel free with candidates to allow them to make a profession of faith at any time during the year that we feel it's appropriate to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you do find people in such widely different places, and I think every parish needs to have a, that flexibility to respond pastorally to where the person is. Mm -hmm. Now, Marilyn asks, if the inquiry sessions are open to all who want to know more about Catholicism, how do you move inquirers to the catechumenate? Do they leave others behind to continue learning? Yes, indeed they do. We have, um, they, they tend to move on in groups simply because they get comfortable, you know, talking among themselves, using them, their own, themselves as a support group. But if your question, Marilyn, is regarding people who are already Catholic, who are participating in inquiry just to be part of the discussion group, then yes, indeed, we do have people who are already Catholic who come to the inquiry group. They may not come every week, but they kind of pop in every now and then as their time allows, simply because they love participating in the discussion. And so far, it could certainly become a problem if the group got too large and didn't allow for individual sharing as much. But so far, we have not found that to be a problem, so we have allowed that to continue. Okay, good. And uh, Christine asks, could you clarify what times you meet at the dismissal, during the week, at night, et cetera, et cetera? So you said that there were two, two sessions during the week where people kind of are involved twice. So why don't you say how you do that at St. Elizabeth? Sure. What we do is inquiry is every Monday night from 7.30 to 8.30. So, and that's what goes throughout the year. When we move a group, an individual or a group, it usually is a group of at least two or three, into the catechumenate, they are coming on Sunday to a mass that we have specified is going to be the, the RCIA mass at which a dismissal occurs. And for that time period, they stay in the church until the homily is over. And at the conclusion of the homily, we have a little dismissal prayer that is said, and they are sent forth to further study the scriptures and the homily that we just heard until the end of Mass. We, so we end that session at the same time the Mass ends. We're just in a different room. And we happen to have a room right there outside the main church doors off of our gathering space, so everyone's still in the same building. And so it, during the catechumenate time period, they are coming two times a week. Um, well, hopefully they're going to Mass all the time, so they're still coming two times a week. But the formal gathering is only during the catechumenate time where they're coming to the Mass on Sunday as a group, and then they're also coming to the catechumenate meeting, which also occurs on Monday night from 7.30 to 8.30, but in a different room and with different facilitators than the inquiry group. Okay, good, thank you. Now, th th these two questions, may uh, be related to each other or, and maybe not, but I, I think they raise good questions. Karina asks, how would you help people develop a relationship with Christ in addition to learning about the church? And Thomas asks, do you weave Lexio Divina into your weekly facilitation sessions? 
Well, first of all, Thomas, yes, we do. Um, Lexio Divina, if people are unfamiliar with that, um, my understanding anyway is basically basing your scripture readings on your discussions, and we do include that in what we do. Uh, more so in the catechumenate, when people have moved that far in their journey, than we do in the inquiry part. And then Karina, um, how would you help people develop a relationship with Christ in addition to learning about the church? Um, I'm not really sure what you mean by that as if it's separate, but we are, we're talking to people about, when we meet with them, we're talking to them about how our relationship with Christ is not just coming to the fore when we're in the church building. That what we believe as Catholics is that what we know about Jesus and what we take from his teachings means that's the way that we operate in our everyday life. And so I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but that definitely is part of the discussion that we have with our RCIA group. Sure, because uh, the process of conversion is as much about spirituality and spiritual growth, uh, far more about that actually than about information about the church and what the catechism says here or there. So mm -hmm. um, that, that obviously is a key focus. And people experience conversion in, in different ways. Some people are very conscious of almost everything that's happening and others there's a lot going on in their heart and they kind of know it but they kind of don't. So it, it kind of helps people discern where the Spirit is leading them. And it is part of what we, um, we being the pastor and myself, when we have our one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one meetings with these individuals as they go through their journey, it's one of the questions that I know he asks and that I ask as well, is that how are they feeling about their individual relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. as they go through this? Mm -hmm. So that, because the discussion groups could, by nature of just having the whole discussion, be more focused on what they're learning about the practicality mm -hmm and the teachings. And so in the one-on-ones, we get more. And hopefully with their sponsors, that's coming up as well. Right. Yeah, that would be great to ask your ordinary Catholics how they're feeling about their relationship with Jesus. That before was, they turn and run away. <laughs> before they turn and run away. I hope none of the uh, homilists put the, uh, the candidates and catechumens to sleep before they go into their session. So Charlene is the last question and leads up to uh, actually some things we want to talk about. What kinds of promotional material do we use to invite people to consider the RCIA? Good question, Charlene. We've come up with a few, quite a few things at our place. We have a bulletin board, first of all. So we often, we don't put the same thing up there all the time year round because people just stop looking at things if they see the same thing there all the time. So we'll post uh, things up there, information about the next, um, I say the next RCI series starting because we do have several start times, even though it's year-round, but just to encourage people that they can jump in at any time. We've put together our own little brochure that's a threefold uh, colored brochure that we leave on. We have a large gathering space with a large table that can hold a lot of materials. And our people will come in and they'll just circle around that table when they come into Mass and see what new is there. So we'll leave brochures there. We have a ministry fair annually. And so we have a table set up about the RCIA with information there. And then we also are encouraging people in any, uh, in any meetings or committees that I'm involved with, I'm always encouraging them, if you know anybody, tell them you know, to come in and talk to us. We have in the past done things like uh, neighborhood picnics where we ask our Catholic people in the neighborhood to uh, one, one family host it and we invite everyone in the neighborhood, but we ask them to invite their non-Catholic neighbors to come as well, and that has gotten some people involved in the parish. A lot of it, you start talking to people, and it's the people sitting in the pew who have a neighbor who's not Catholic that is bringing them in with them. Great. Thank you, Kathy. We're uh, just about finished now. Uh, before we go, uh, talking about promotional material for the RCIA, uh, we remind you of our newly released Neighbors Reaching Neighbors program a parish toolkit for invitation. And this was designed precisely to try and stir up curiosity, interest, and initial information about the Catholic Church for people who are potential inquirers, to change seekers, to find seekers, and then convert them to inquirers. 
Uh, there are brochures and booklets and templates for all, all kinds of letters and news releases, etc. Uh, a manual to kind of talk about ways to think about outreach and get your parish to reach out. There are two DVDs. Uh, one of them is a DVD that's really perfect for the inquiry phase, um, an introduction to the Catholic people. It's not about theology. It's not about doctrine. It's about us and who we are and what is it that, that makes us work in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And then another DVD about uh, how to talk about faith, Catholics being able to give witness, and then ways to develop and think about outreach in the parish. So this is $10 off if you uh, use the promotional code INVITE. So we encourage you uh, to look at that. I think the DVDs alone are worth the price. And then with the $10 off, it's, uh, it's a terrific uh, bargain. We are working on upcoming uh, webinars. Um, and we're going to ask you to stay in touch. Summer's coming. But I know we're going to have two webinars on uh, the joy of the gospel which will give us an opportunity to explore the directions that Pope Francis is laying out for us uh, as, as we look at uh, living and sharing our faith more effectively. Once again, thank you all so much for joining with us. We appreciate uh, your connection with uh, Paulist Evangelization Ministries. I want to thank Kathy for coming down on the threat of severe thunderstorm. I want to thank God for not sending the severe thunderstorm <laughs> so we could get through this webinar. And I ask God to bless you all in your ministries as they continue through the summer. Thank you. Thank you.